Good morning. As I mentioned last week, every Sunday throughout the church year is supposed to be a celebration of Easter. But especially being so close to Easter, let's go ahead and do it again. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Never get tired of saying that. I mean, you might, but, but I don't. So we're going to keep saying that for a couple more weeks. Welcome to those of you who are watching online or listening on the radio. We welcome you in the Lord's name here gathering with the saints of his people in his house to be reminded once more of the wonderful things that our Savior has done for us. Before we get started with our time of worship, just a few quick announcements. Uh, the many announcements of the bulletin have been in there for weeks. I'm not going to repeat those. I'm just going to highlight a couple of new ones. Uh, first of all, it's, today's the last day to put your apron uh, for the No Bake Bake Sale into the cake pan on the back table. So uh, hopefully if you've been waiting to put that in there, today is the day. Uh, just so you know, I'm going to be gone all day on Tuesday. I'm part of a program of pastors who pray for our legislatures legislators down at the state capitol and this was my turn it came up about once a year I do this and this is when it came up so I will be gone all day at the state capitol for that um, our midweek Bible study which had to end when Lent started is back on again this Wednesday so uh, if you were joining us for our midweek Bible studies at 7 p.m. on Wednesday nights uh, please come back again this Wednesday as we get started once more with that uh, the other announcements, like I said, are ones that you've seen before, so I'm not going to repeat those, but, uh, but please take a look at them, especially if you haven't been in church recently, uh, they're new to you, so uh, please take a look at those announcements as you have the opportunity. Today's order of service, oh, we have one more, Gary. Uh, because of the convention next month, we're going to change the council meeting to a week from Monday. So it's what date? May 9th or 2nd, I'm sorry. May 2nd. Okay, so the church council and elders meetings will be on May 2nd, not May 9th. Okay, I thought I was going to get out of that meeting, but it looks like I won't be able to. I'll come up with something. <laughs> Okay, our order of service today is divine service setting for uh, the liturgy is printed out for you in the bulletins. Um, so let's begin our time of worship by singing our opening hymn, uh, hymn 478, the day of resurrection. May God bless our worship.
turn to the liturgy in the bulletin, beginning with the invocation and confession and absolution. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word and call upon him in prayer and praise, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, merciful Father, in holy baptism, you declared us to be your children and gathered us into your one holy church, in which you daily and richly forgive us our sins and grant us new life through your Spirit. Be in our midst, enliven our faith, and graciously receive our prayer and praise. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our opening sentences for today are taken from Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His hosts. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you shining stars. Praise Him, you highest heavens. And you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord. For He commanded, and they were created. And He established them forever and ever. He gave a decree, and it shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth. You great sea creatures and all deeps. Fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind fulfilling his word, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all livestock, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord. For his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his saints. For the people of Israel who are near to him. Praise the Lord. We now sing the Kyrie to the tune of Amazing Grace. Almighty God, grant that we who have celebrated the mystery of our Lord's resurrection may, by the help of your grace, bring forth the fruits of the Spirit in our life and conduct. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us now sing the hymn of praise to the tune of Hark the Herald Angels.
be seated. During the season of Easter, the weeks following Easter, uh, the first reading of the day does not come from the Old Testament, but rather from the book of Acts. And so our reading that is appointed for today comes from the book of Acts, chapter 5. Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is, the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out, and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. Now when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council, all the senate of the people of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison. So they returned and reported, We found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. And someone came and told them, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you to not teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the other apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading for today comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 1. This is written by John the Apostle. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, and to Smyrna, and to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, 
like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise now out of reverence for the gospel and prepare for it by speaking responsively the gradual as it is printed out in your bulletins. Alleluia! Christ has risen from the dead. God the Father has crowned him with glory and honor. He has made him ruler over the works of his hands. He has put everything under his feet. Alleluia! The gospel reading appointed for the first Sunday after Easter comes from John's Gospel, chapter 20. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to Christ. Amen. You may be seated. At this time I'd like to invite the kids to come forward for a brief children's message. And yes, now that Lent is over, I am handing out candy. Good morning. Thanks for coming up here today. Today I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to give you the candy first. So take a couple jelly beans out of there and try to pick jelly beans that are not the same color. Don't worry about taking more than one or two. If you leave them in the basket, I'll just end up eating them. Better in your belly than mine. Okay, so everybody's got some different jelly beans, right? Did you know that each one of these jelly beans in all of its different colors actually kind of tell the story of our life together with God? It tells the story of how he created us and then Adam and Eve fell into sin and all of us became guilty of sin because of that. And then Christ came and died for us and rose again and now we get to live forever with Christ. That's reflected in the colors of those jelly beans. So if you have a color green, does anybody have green? Nobody took a green jelly bean? Oh, well, green reminds us of the grass that covers the whole earth that God created for us. That's where our story with God begins, with creation. How about yellow? Anybody got yellow? 
Yeah, yellow reminds us of what? What do you think? The sun. Very good. Yeah, yellow reminds us of the sun that God put in place to continue to give us light and life. Anybody have black? A black jelly bean? Yeah, some people don't like black jelly beans. Well, you know, biblically speaking, people don't like black either because black reminds us of what? Death. And what brought death into the world? Sin. Yeah, so, so black is representing some bad things, that color of black. On the other hand, how about purple? And we got purple? Oh, the Vikings colors? You didn't grab purple? Oh, one of you I'm so disappointed in. <laughs> I know, you didn't know what was coming. Well, purple not only represents the Vikings, it also rem reminds us of something that Jesus wore. Do you remember what Jesus wore that was purple? Yeah, when they crucified him, they put a purple robe around him to mock him and make his suffering even worse. And so that purple reminds us of the things that Jesus suffered and endured in order to take away our sin. How about red? Anybody got a red jelly bean? Oh, everybody's got a red jelly bean. Yeah, what do you suppose red reminds us of? That's right, Jesus' blood, the blood he shared for, or shed for us, which gives us life. His blood gives life to us, and we remind, we're reminded that he shed that blood for us on the cross. How about orange? Anybody got an orange? Yeah, we got some orange, okay? I don't know if you'll guess this, but the color of the sky in the morning is what? Orange. Unless it's supposed to be a stormy day, then sometimes it's red. But orange it reminds us of sunrise, because what did Jesus do at sunrise? He rose from the dead, and he's the Son of God. So the Son of God rose at sunrise, and that's what we're reminded of with the orange jelly bean. How about white? You got a white? Yeah, white reminds us of innocence and purity. This is the perf perfect purity that God sees in us now because Jesus has taken all of our sins away. So this is the, the color of God's uh, innocence and righteousness that he's given us. And then finally, the color pink. Anybody have a pink one? Okay, pink is supposed to remind us of the future, the eternity that we have, the eternal life that we have with God in heaven. So that's kind of what pink is supposed to remind us of. So these are the colors of Easter in the most common Easter candy, which are jelly beans. So as you're eating those later on, with your parents' permission, of course, maybe they don't want you getting all sugared up early in the morning, uh, but if they allow you to have those as you're eating those jelly beans, and all the jelly beans that you have in the future, uh, you can remember these different colors and what they represent about God's relationship with us. Let's say a quick prayer. Dear God, we thank you for creating us and for saving us from our sins and giving us eternal life. All of these gifts are ours because of Jesus. And so we thank you for his death and his resurrection, which give to us the hope and the promise that we are your children and that we will live with you forever. Thank you for all of the wonderful things you've done for us, God. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you've already got your candy, so thanks for coming up here. You guys can head back to your seats. Meanwhile, the congregation will continue by singing our next hymn, hymn 474, Alleluia, Jesus is Risen.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. If you were to look at all of the appointed readings for today, hopefully you'll notice that there's one thing they all have in common. Fear. In the first reading from Acts chapter 5, the people supported and believed in the ministry of the apostles, but they didn't dare to join them for fear of what might happen to them if they did. Meanwhile, the leaders who the people were afraid of were themselves afraid of the people. In the New Testament reading, John fell terrified at the feet of God because seeing God face to face is a terrifying thing. And finally, in the gospel reading, where were the disciples? Hiding out, behind locked doors, afraid of the Jewish leaders because they had put Jesus to death and now perhaps they were hunting down all of his followers. In each one of the readings for today, someone was afraid of something. And that fear not only affected their minds, it also affected their actions as well. They may have wanted to make different choices, but their fears wouldn't let them. Unfortunately, that's the kind of power that fear has over people. Have you ever heard of the infamous uh, stagecoach robber, Black Bart? It's obviously a little before all of our times, because from 1875 until 1882, he was one of the most feared outlaws in the West. And yet, although Black Bart carried a gun, he never fired a single shot. He never took a single hostage. He simply wore a black mask. And the threat of him using his gun, coupled with that mask, is what frightened people into turning over their valuables to him without a moment's hesitation. Bart never had to fire a shot because he knew how to use people's fears against them to get them to do what he wanted them to do. Ironically, fear is also what caused Black Bart's downfall. You see, Bart robbed all of those stagecoaches on foot. And then he ran away on foot because he was deathly afraid of something. Can you guess what it is? Horses. Yeah. In the end, that's what did him in. After robbing his last stagecoach and, and uh, starting to walk away, someone actually had the courage to pursue him. And since he didn't have a horse to get away, they caught up to him and shot him. They didn't kill him, but, but they were able to end his reign of terror, all because he was too scared to ride a horse and because someone else finally wasn't afraid to pursue him. Here's another story for you. When Benjamin Harrison was president of the United States, he often went to bed with the lights on. It wasn't because he was afraid of the dark. He was afraid of electricity. You see, it was during his term in office that electric lights were installed in the White House. And he was so scared to touch the switches that he wouldn't do it. He had one of the servants do it. And if none of them were around at night, he just left the lights on. What kind of fears do we have? And what kind of choices do we make based on those fears? Some people are afraid of things like heights or being enclosed in tight spaces or of the dark. On the other hand, some other people have developed fears based on the painful experiences that they've had. Now, all of those folks are just like everybody else who wrestles with some kind of fear. We all have had our view of the world and the choices that we make influenced by our fears. And that's why Jesus was so adamant about telling his followers, fear not. In fact, of all the commands that Jesus declared during his earthly ministry, that was the one that he declared more than any other. Now, you might have guessed that he would have declared, love God or love your neighbor the most. And if you had guessed that, you'd be close. He said those kinds of commands the second most times. 
But the command that Jesus gave more often than any other was some variation of fear not. In fact, if you take all of the commands that Jesus gave in the scriptures, almost 20% of them had to do with encouraging his followers to not be afraid. Now ask yourself, why would Jesus want that message said more than any other, even more than telling them to love God? It's because Jesus knew the power that fear has to manipulate a person's mind as well as their actions. And he knew that Satan was going to use that weapon all the time against God's people. And he does. How many of us are afraid to pray publicly before meals or during a really stressful time? How many feel uncomfortable owning or wearing something that would advertise our love for Christ? How many people remain in conversations or situations that we know are wrong because we're too scared to walk away and be alone? How many of us have the courage to tell a boss or a school or a coach that we won't do what they've told us to do because it interferes with our efforts to put God first in our lives? Here's another story for you. When Nikita Khrushchev came to power in the old Soviet Union, he publicly denounced uh, the policies and the atrocities of his predecessor, Joseph Stalin. On one occasion, as he was criticizing Stalin in a public meeting, Khrushchev was interrupted by a heckler. Someone yelled out from the crowd, You were one of Stalin's colleagues. Why didn't you try to stop him back then? Khrushchev immediately stood up and roared, Who said that? And he looked around the room. And the room got deathly silent, and no one moved a muscle. And then Khrushchev sat back down and said, now you know why. In other words, Khrushchev didn't do anything because he was afraid. Stalin would have had him killed for saying anything. And Khrushchev knew it. And that same thing is true for many of us today. We know what's right and we know what's wrong because we know God's word. But sometimes our fear of the crowds that we can see is greater than our fear of the God that we can't see. Besides, we tell ourselves, God will forgive us. The world won't. And so we give in to fear, even though it means turning away from God. We're afraid of being called some kind of bigot or labeled hateful, evil, or ignorant. We're afraid of losing friends, of not being popular, of being isolated or rejected. And although it's not likely to happen in our country, at least not in a widespread way, there are lots of Christians around the world who are afraid that if their allegiance to Christ was made public, they would become victims of violence or even death. In our world today, there are so many things for people to be afraid of. But please believe me when I tell you, there is nothing new under the sun. These are not new fears. People have always wanted to be popular, and they've always hated being hated and excluded by others. People have always wanted to be liked, and they've tried to avoid being rejected. Now, the times, the locations, the cultures may have changed, but the people have not, and neither have their fears. So when we see the disciples hiding behind locked doors, or crowds of people who refuse to let their faith be seen by others. We should certainly be able to sympathize with them, because we all have the same kinds of fears. And that's why it is so important for us to see the transformation that took place in the lives of the disciples. On Easter Eve, they were terrified of what the Jewish leaders might do to them if they could find them. But now look at them in Acts chapter 5. There they are in the middle of the temple square declaring that Jesus Christ was the Lord. What changed? Well, first of all, we knew, we know that they were eyewitnesses that Jesus had risen from the dead. 
They all saw him with their own eyes. But that alone wasn't enough to give them the courage to risk their lives in order to tell other people about Jesus. That kind of power, the kind that conquers all fears, only comes from the Holy Spirit. And when Jesus breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit came upon them again at Pentecost, that's when things changed. After that, they weren't afraid of anything. The boldness that we saw in today's first reading, that took place after they had already been arrested previously and beaten and told to be quiet. And yet they refused to let that keep them from continuing to do what Christ had called them to do. So when the leaders tried to threaten them again, what did Peter and the rest of them say? We must obey God rather than men. And that's the attitude that Christians have to have when we're confronted by the enemies of Christ. Since we know that Christ is king and has conquered every enemy, including even death, what else is there to be afraid of? Whatever loss we might have to endure is really just adding to the glory that we are giving to God. So what can the world do to us if our hope is in Christ? In the early Christian church, when it was still illegal to be a Christian, there was a faithful church father named John Chrysostom. And when he was being attacked by those in power due to his allegiance to Christ, he responded to them, What should I fear? Death? You know that for me, Christ is life. So now dying for me is gain. Should I fear exile or poverty? We brought nothing into the world and can carry nothing out. Thus all the terrors of the world are as nothing in my eyes, and I smile at all its good things. Poverty I do not fear. Riches I will not miss. Death I do not shrink from. Now, John Chrysostom died during his journey into exile. But having heard what he wrote, I'm asking you, does that sound like someone who was a victim? Not at all. He was more than a conqueror through Christ who loved him. He knew who he was and whose he was, and on top of all that, he knew where he was going. He was a baptized child of God. He had been transformed from a condemned sinner into a beloved saint. And no matter where his life's journey might lead him, the destination was not going to change. He was going to end up in the glorious paradise that his Lord had prepared for him. John had that kind of confidence because he knew that Jesus was called the firstborn of the dead for a reason. What happened to him on Easter Sunday will someday happen to all of us who belong to him by faith. And so Christ has made it possible for us to see our own future. He showed us that our life's journey will not end in a grave. We will be raised up and continue following in the footsteps of Jesus into life again, because death cannot hold us or defeat us, because it's already been defeated for us by him. It's Christ Jesus and the power of his resurrection that enables us to face our fears of being hated, rejected, or ridiculed, and then overcome those fears. And we can do that because just as Jesus did for his disciples, he has done it for us. He has breathed on us in baptism and has given us his Holy Spirit. He has changed us from sinners into saints, and therefore we have a new way of seeing things and a new way of responding to them. We now have the power and the courage to live our lives for Christ. Therefore, fear, nor anything else, should never get in the way of families praying together wherever they are, of reading their Bibles together and talking together about what they read. Fear should never keep us from saying and doing what's right. And we should never, ever be afraid to declare 
with our words, and with our deeds, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and He is our beloved Savior. Dear saints of God, fear not. The living one who died is alive again. And because he is, you shall be also. Nothing in this world can compare to the one who is coming with the clouds, who is the ruler of all the kings of the earth. And even if the whole world were aligned against you, he will always be with you. And he has already overcome the world. So fear not. Believe and be his, now and forevermore. Amen. We now continue by singing uh, a confession of our faith with the creed set to the tune of immortal, invisible, God only wise. Let us now rise as our offerings are brought forward and sing the offertory, which is hymn 946. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have not given us a spirit of timidity, and you would not have us live in fear as we live out our faith. 
We thank you for the hope and the confidence that we have on account of our Lord's resurrection, knowing that, like him, someday we also shall rise victoriously over death. Until that day comes, continually fill us with your Holy Spirit, that by his power we may boldly confess Christ Jesus as Lord and give him glory with our words and our deeds. O oh Lord God, we come to you today on behalf of those whom we know to be struggling with all kinds of difficult situations and battles that they're facing. And we come to ask you to have mercy on them and to give them the healing and restoration that they seek according to your gracious will. We pray this especially for Beth, Elizabeth, Ruth, Amy, Michelle, Stephen, Trevor, Rebecca, Melody, Rosemary, Madeline, Lydia, Sarah, Tom, Jack, Connie, Michelle, Maggie Jo, Janessa, Judy, Ron, Lois, Gary, and all those we name before you now silently in our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. Holy Spirit, we thank you for the gifts of grace that we have received from you at our baptisms. As we remember the blessings that we received from you when you breathed on us at the font, we also rejoice with those who celebrate their baptismal birthdays this week, including Bella, Jeremiah, Corbin, Wayne, Max, Keith, Kevin, Pam, Chris, Pat, Bentley, and Gemma. May they and all of us be continually refreshed and renewed by the gifts that you poured out on us that day. Gracious God, we lift up to you today those who are hurting, hungry, or homeless, those who feel lonely or hopeless. Come alongside them, O Lord, and be their source of comfort and joy. We also lift up to you all widows, orphans, those still in the womb, those with special needs, and those in the twilights of their lives, so that the world might love them as much as you love them. And we pray for organizations like Orphan Grain Train, Options for Women, Lutherans for Life, Prairie Five, and others who all strive to affirm the preciousness of life. Help them through their challenging times, Lord, and bless their work and cause it to prosper. All of these things and whatever else may be on our hearts and minds this day, we pray all of it to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ by praying the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, that thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Almighty and Merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless you and keep you, now and forevermore. Amen. You may be seated for the singing of our closing hymn, Christ Has Arisen, Alleluia, hymn 466. <laughs>